Good morning. Welcome. Thanks for attending this webinar today. My name is Karen Rogers. I am a speech language pathologist and I'm talking to you from the Stern Center. And today we're going to go through and look at your child's development and make sure, give you some peace of mind to check on whether or not it's on track. There we are, and that's, that's me, so you have a visual of what I look like, and that's I'm there with my two boys. Um, I've been practicing speech-language pathology since 2004, and before that, um, I worked with, I was a preschool teacher, so early education, daycare centers, and preschool is what I've been surrounded with for, I feel like, the past 20 years. So I'm pretty versed um, on the population of zero to three. Um, when I was in graduate school, I was working and involved with a research project that looked at environments of child care centers throughout the greater Philadelphia area. And it was a fascinating research project. And what we found, that environment was huge. Um, and what we're doing at this time makes a huge difference in the development of children. So here's an outline for what we'll be discussing today. We're going to go through um, the stages of social development from zero to three and speech development, looking at their individual sound development and what they're doing with their output and how it's related to feeding development, when to introduce solids, what to expect at different stages, um, and then language development. So how they're understanding the incoming information and what they're doing with it to use that information and communicate. And we'll also look at how they influence one another. So when we look at the whole child, each of these skills will be covering, that we'll be covering for the next 60 minutes are developing simultaneously. You will also see how each individual developmental skill influences the development of the other. For example, each step of social interaction provides opportunities for growth in speech, language, and feeding development. And you'll see how these overlap as we progress. We know from research conducted at the Department of Pediatrics from the Woman and Infants Hospital in Rhode Island that the time interval between 32 weeks, so for, if they're not a NICU baby, this is still in, in mama's belly, and may provide a window of opportunity for parents and caregivers to expose their infants to early interactions and social development. So we know that it starts at a very early age. So we, we'll be starting there with social skill development. And we'll be following this diagram to see the progression. Notice that the, at the core we have engagement and self-regulation. In order to attend, a child must be calm and alert. And that ability to sustain attention with a caregiver for 10 to 30 seconds first emerges around three to five months of age. And if you think about that, 10 to 30 seconds could be a long time. So that attention, you know, can start earlier than three to five months, just in shorter spurts. Every interaction counts for brain development. The current studies found evidence in support of the view that quality of early mother to infant interactions may influence infants' brain responses to emotional expressions and highlights the potential important ro role of infants' neural coding of positive emotional expressions in particular. So each interaction is fostering this social development. So 
So if we look at that first stage, the core of social development that we have there, within a few months, the babies learn to transfer their emotions from their own inner sensations, such as a tiny gas bubble in their tummy, to the world outside themselves. To do that, they have to want to look or listen or pay attention to the outside world. Caregivers entice this desire with gentle touches, soothing voices, big smiles, and expressive eyes, all of which a baby finds pleasurable. So as a parent, we want to look at our affect. So let's look at stage one, and again, we're looking at that engagement. And the focus of this stage is what we call shared attention, so to learn and interact socially. Children need to be able to focus, be calm, and actively take in information from their experience with others, from what they see, from what they hear, smell, touch, and taste and from the way that they move. So they're using their senses to learn and take in information from their environment. And they have to be calm and alert to do that. And you see this baby here, very calm and alert and engaged with dad. So cute. So if we look a little bit further into stage one, we have that pre-intentional stage. And this is when the babies are responding, they're smiling and laughing, crying and grasping in a communicative manner and way. And we can see that this baby's looking at mama's mouth. And as they grow through this stage, the pleasure babies receive from their caregivers, that interaction, that back and forth flow, enables them to decipher patterns in the caregivers' voices and facial expressions. So they're taking in all these little social subtleties through nonverbal language. And that reflects the caregiver's feelings and intentions. So we're going to move on. And we're still in stage one in that engagement and regulation because they have to sustain that in order to pick up all these developmental skills. Then they start to... Um, as they grow through that st this stage, the pleasure babies receive from their caregivers enables them to decipher the patterns in the caregivers' voices and their facial expressions. We saw from the earlier research that that rapid growth of development that occurs during this stage and once a child learns to sit up, there's a whole new world for them to take in and understand. And through these exchanges, babies begin to engage in that back and forth emotional signaling or two-way communication. This prelinguistic intentional stage really has that intentionality where they're using gesture such as reaching, pointing, shaking their head no, um, giving and showing, and sometimes even waving hi and bye. So there's a communicative intent that's much different from that pre-intentional stage where they're still exploring. And this usually happens between six and nine months, and again, maturically, they're sitting up, so they're taking in the world from a different point of view. And you see that in their social development. So as we move on, and you see how these overlap in stage one, we should start to see around six or nine months during that same stage when they start sitting up, some babbling. And you can see how this speech is kind of overlapping into the social development. And this engagement and the ability to self-regulate is still there. And it's providing those windows of opportunities for learning and pruning the neural pathways of the developing brain. Interactions scaffold these opportunities. And intention is the gateway for social thinking and development. Imitation 
is the gateway for using that social communication skills and expressing those feelings. So we're modeling during this stage and they're paying close attention. Um, modeling for babbling is very important. They should start showing signs of laughing, listening, babbling, clapping, smiling, and they're communicating in a social and intent way. So song play, talking to your children, reading to your children, very important at this stage. Because every time, every interaction counts for connecting those neural pathways. So let's review stage one. We have that engagement where the child's body is ready. It's calm and alert and open, aware of the world around them. They're searching and experimenting with the thoughts of others. And they're using what they have already learned to show what their thoughts and feelings are so that others understand. And we see that as they go through the pre-intentional, pre-linguistic, and babbling stages. So as you can see, these milestones are happening at a very rapid pace and are happening, happening simultaneously. So next I'm going to give you a view um, of what all of this looks like all put together. Here we go. This is baby G with mom. So I want you to take a look at her and think about those stages. Um, and then we'll talk about and think about, you know, she in the, the pre-intentional stage where she's taking in all of these signals or the pre-linguistic stage where she's giving them back. So I'm going to show you baby G and, and then get your thoughts on what you see. Do you want to sing a song? Okay. Okay. Itsy bitsy spider went up the water spout. Down came the rain, and watched the spider out. Out came the sun, and dried up all the rain. And the itsy bitsy spider went up the sun again. Did you like it? You did. Move your hands. Okay. I mean, isn't that precious? She's amazing, isn't she? <laughs> um, so she is definitely joint referencing her mom and aware. She has that sustained attention. She's calm and alert. And this allows her to use her pre-intentional skills by responding with those motor skills she has developed, such as moving her arms and turn taking with those vocalizations and verbal play with mom. So some really fascinating stuff that we got to see there. And as you you watch it, you see her watching mom intently, um, discovering her arms and legs and where they're at, and trying, you can see some early signs of imitation there too. Pretty fascinating. I'm a big fan of Baby J. I love to watch that video. Okay, so this brings us to stage two of social development. Um, with warm nurturing, those babies become progressively more invested and interested in certain people. They now learn to distinguish between the pleasures of interacting with the human world and interest in inanimate objects. So this is a big leap. This is where they start to play and interact with their world. So let's look at some of that play and interaction. This happens around 9 to 16 months. They're sitting up. Some of them possibly may even be walking. And this opens a whole new world for them. 
babies begin to engage in that back and forth emotional signaling or two-way communication. Um, those reciprocal back and forth games that you play, such as peekaboo, you see grandma doing with the baby here. Some true words start to come out with imitation. Um, verbs saying no is a popular one for this age. Um, more, all done, hi, bye, and possibly some names of family members or a favorite family pet. Um, and this can be done through sign language if they haven't developed the auto motor capacities to m produce those words, or it be can be verbally. So nonverbal communication counts also. Just keep that in mind. So with, during this play and interaction stage, you start to see comprehension of simple two-word combinations. So they're comprehending, they're taking in those auditory signals, processing them, and getting some meaning behind in those words. Um, their communication is purposeful and includes functions such as behavior regulation, requesting, and protesting. So we can see how um, this ability is really going to affect their behavior, um, joint attention, commenting and requesting information, and calling and greeting and showing off. It's a stage of shared communication that logic and a sense of reality begin. A baby's eyes follow a toy if it falls to the ground, and this sense of causality marks the beginning of a sense of reality which is based on distinguishing the actions of others from one's own. There is a me doing something to a not me, and their sense of self has emerged. And this sense of self starts to become a little bit more obvious when they start refusing to do things that were easy before, such as eating and throwing food on the floor, and we'll go through that. It's all normal. So let's put it all together for stage two. Um, this is where they're engaging. They're able to sustain that engagement and that back and forth, either non-verbally or verbally. They're initiating dependency or closeness um, by saying no or cuddling with mom. Uh, their fun, fun and pleasurable curiosity and assertiveness start to emerge. They'll take your hand and lead you to something or they'll imitate dada, um, single words, and even some phrases, uh-oh is a big one. They're able to make a choice when offered two toys, and they have, they develop that object permanence while they're search for something that was just removed from a field of vision. You can do a simple test with this by just throwing a blanket over a toy. Um, and imitation is is what they're doing. They're looking at the mouths and the mouth movements and the sounds and the words and all those environmental noises and they're playing and imitating all those life scenarios. So this is a big leap socially where they're playing and interacting. They have some massive skills developing at the same time. So let's take a look at how they're using some of their communication. I'm going to show you a video. Um, these are my little guys. I want you to look at their engagement, the back and forth exchanges, um, any words, or how they're using their communication to self-regulate.
Okay, so we see them there, and thank goodness he had that word no to tell his brother to kind of back off. Um, otherwise, there would have been some tumbling there, wouldn't there? But we can see how important some of that language and that social awareness um, is when it comes to that back and forth interaction. Um, we also saw some in imitation of environmental noise. They're using toys a lot more. Um, advanced than they were before, understanding the purpose behind the movements, and continuing to take the word the world in from all around them. So that's going to bring us right into stage three of social development, and this is where the child's body can sustain that engagement in order to play and interact and develop the ideas, the concepts, and experiences to scaffold for comprehension and the use of social communication. So let's look a little bit closely into that. What comprehension and use looks like at stage three is again that initiating and sustaining social interactions for longer periods of time and they're developing the fine and gross motor skills for age-appropriate play. So being able to use those toys functionally while simultaneously producing vocalizations or words um, so that they can connect those two modalities during their play. They're able to, that, and when we look at um, that core again, just to remind you that engagement and self-regulation, they need to sustain that at this point um, in order to foster those back and forth interactions. Using their interaction skills to combine those emerging two to three words at a time in that reciprocal back and forth exchange with a caregiver. So no mommy is a popular one. Um, we saw some of that in the video, some just a minute. Um, they've heard that before, obviously. Um, so that imitation, so watch your modeling, because kids tend to repeat the words that have the most inflection. Um, I remember doing some early intervention in Atlantic City, and I was working with some twins, and their, their first words were appropriate, but not something I was modeling to them. <laughs> So watch what you model, because they're listening. So let's put it all together for stage three. This is when um, that symbolic play skills start to emerge and develop as they start to imitate what they see in their environment. Um, so it's something that they've seen before, and they're using it to play out and understand in real life. And again, they're building on that engagement to be able to sustain and initiate those social interactions with caregivers, siblings, and peers. So we're going to take a look at another video so you can see this unfold and how stage three. Oh, I see there are a whole bunch of giants that one day you died, but I saved that because I stored up for you because you wouldn't keep them that I did.
Okay, so I forgot to warn you about the roaring dinosaurs in the background. Um, they're not in the video, but there were a few other kids in the background that were pretending to be dinosaurs. Um, but we can see here that they're using their language, um, taking turns, they're, they're engaging in that reciprocity, and combining two to three words. So that's what stage three looks like, which is going to make us move right on to stage four. This brings us to our last stage of social development for birth to three, bridging ideas and sharing. This is where you'll see that stages depend and build upon one another. We cannot build ideas and share them if we are unable to engage, interact, comprehend, and use. So let's go into stage four. And then we see how she is imitating her environment here where she's feeding the doll and putting the doll to sleep. As they grow and interact, children are seeing the world in patterns, which increases their understanding of how it works and leads to expectations and then mastery. Children use this ability to distinguish from among many patterns in the emotional expressions of others, those meaning safety and comfort from those meaning danger, which is an important skill. They can tell approval from disapproval, acceptance from rejection, and these are very um, things that are socially ambiguous to pick up, so it's really sophisticated when you think about it. Children start to use this awareness to respond differently to people depending on their emotional tone. And this ability to decipher human exchanges and pick up emotional cues before any words are exchanged is a super sense that often operates faster than our conscious awareness. In fact, it is the foundation of social life. So again, that demand for self-regulation and engagement increases as we look at their ability to sustain a continuous back and forth communicative exchange. And again, we see the senses playing a huge role in our development to put all these skills together. Can they move toy pieces to imitate movements and play while describing the actions at the same time to develop a play scenario? There is a lot going on at this stage for our kiddos. So are they using that visual spatial sense that they're motor planning and are they taking in information auditorily and being able to put it back verbally while simultaneously elaborating on those pretend scenarios and sustain their interaction with a person. It's pretty amazing when you break it down and see how much they're putting together at this age. Also during this stage, they're using a variety of pragmatic, and function, pragmatic functions, including planning, reporting, requesting and confirmation, commenting, and then the ability to continue to elaborate in order to repair those communicative breakdowns. So let's look a little bit closely at this because this is where it gets a little complicated. So we're going to look at pragmatics specifically, that social language, how they're using it, that understanding what to do. Um, so planning, an example would be, I'm going to take Thomas to the station, telling you what they're going to do. Reporting, uh, Johnny fell and got hurt, or just reporting could be tattletaling. Um, requesting information, are we going to get a snack today? Um, can we go out and play? Commenting. Look at that cool bug. Um, and then elaborating. So elaborating really puts a big demand on those social language vocabulary. We see a but in there, which is a coordinating conjunction to add our ideas. But I like butterflies. So we're going to look in another video of what stage four looks like, and I want you to pay close attention to their pragmatic skills. My hey. turn, please. What? Where's your waiting hand? No, no, no. Where's your waiting hand? Where's your waiting hand? I know you like green. I like white. 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 If you want to have a turn, use your waiting hand. Please. I got it! 
Oh, use your weeding hand, John. Weeding hand. Goodness. So it's a good thing we have bean bags around. Um, so we can see how they are using those language skills, and it's a very much more sophisticated form of language. Um, so your turn. Let's test. You, what you think about the pragmatic function, does the phrase, but I like white, serve? Is it to report, request information? Is it to comment or to elaborate? So if you want to type in your answer, A would be for report, B would be to request information, C would be commenting, and D would be elaboration. So what do you see? So we have some D's in there, right? Okay. So some people said elaborate and D. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. We look at that coordinating conjunction but used in order to add his thoughts and feelings specifically in this case for the preference for the color white. So we're going to move on. Let's put it together for stage four. That connecting one's own idea to someone else's logically is a basis for a new understanding of reality. Um, are they playing spontaneously, initiating that pretend play, and can they sustain um, for a shared activity of exchanging ideas? Can they use and move the toys appropriately and respond to questions while doing so? Um, and we can see that functional use of ideas and symbols in imaginative play. So they'll talk more to other people and know when they are not clear, and they'll make the corrections to make themselves better understood. So we're going to look at one more video quickly and we'll move on. Hmm. That video is not playing right now. Let's see. What's in there? Okay. So in that video, we're looking at some more pragmatic functions of language where they're labeling, commenting, and commenting. So let's look at the red flags for social development. Um, some of the things that you can keep an eye out for is if the child does not point that, that joint referencing, being aware that other people are there and expressing what they want. Um, if they don't respond to their name, um, Difficulty with that joint referencing, also known as eye contact. So avoiding eye contact or the inability to sustain it for those meaningful interactions. Um, some children show little interest in playing with other children or play in isolation. Um, we want to consider that a red flag and wonder why they're doing that. Um, or if they don't initiate with peers or adults and not being able to repair those communicative breakdowns. So those kids who just shut down or um, have a tantrum instead of being able to repair, those are some of the red flags that warrant um, attention. So that brings us to speech development. And we can see how these are overlapping. When the infant, we're going to look at the infant communication stages um, at birth. Like we saw with baby G, they have those reflexive cries, biological noises. Around two, they, you see them coo, five months. This is when you start to see that emergence of babbling, and they're really paying attention to that sustained engagement. 
to um, imitate your noises. So model, model, babbling. Um, don't feel like a fool doing it. It's very important. So around six to nine months, they're sitting up. And what we consider that true babbling, um, like mama, dada, baba, starts to emerge. And then as they get more advanced oral motor wise, they start to show some variegated babbling and jargon that sounds more like adult speech. And then around 12 months, you should see the emergence of those single words. So that true babbling emerges between five to seven months when they begin to use that consonant vowel sounds of their language in repeated patterns. And research has found that infants shift their attention to the mouth of the person who is talking when they enter that babbling stage. And they continue to focus on the mouth of the person for several months thereafter until they master the basic speech forms of the native language. So they are lip readers. When we look at babbling development, like I said, that reduplicating babbling, approximately between five to nine months, those repeated syllables start to emerge first. That mama, dada um, start to emerge. And again, that is through that vertical plane of movement, which I'll be talking about shortly. And it commonly occurs when they're exploring their environment or those objects, so um, exploring through their senses. And it frequently, um, when we look at speech sound development, it starts to form in the front of the mouth consonants. So those um, consonants that are formed with the tip of your tongue or your lips, ba, ba, da, da, ta, ta. And as they practice that babbling, it gets a little bit more sophisticated where they start to string syllables containing different sounds. So not just the repetitive mama, but that madagaba. Um, sometimes different syllable types emerge. So we see some phonological patterns start to emerge and how this is related to reading and writing skills later on. Um, so the consonant, vowel, consonant, uh, gug, or vowel, consonant, vowel, the ugu. Um, these are all important developmental skills that they're going to need to form those connected patterns later on for words and sentences. So their jargon starts to take on those intonation patterns too that sound like adult speech. So we know from research that children who do not begin that canonical babbling by the age of 12 months were at increased risk for later language deficits. Um, this could be for many reasons, but a, definitely a red flag. And that the phonological complexity of syllable types, like we mentioned before, that consonant, vowel, consonant, um, being able to blend two consonants together with a vowel, like stop, is a predictor of a later phonological development and first words. So if they're not making that, it shows some red flags. So we're going to look at another video of speech development, and I want you to see where they're at. They're about 12 months, and you'll see some of the first words occurring. We'll look at this quickly. Well, that's weird. It was working when we tested it. I apologize. We're going to move on. This will enable me to talk a little bit more about those planes of speech that I mentioned before. So when we look at the different planes of speech development, when kids first start to babble, they're dropping that jaw straight up and down in vertical movements, that ba, ma, and as they sophisticate their babbling, you'll start seeing that repetitive da, da. But if you actually do it um, at home, you can feel your chin drop and go back up in that vertical pattern. And that's what we're looking for on that vertical plane. So as they get into 16 or 24 months, they're still in that vertical plane, 
um, but they're starting to connect words like mama up, dada, and as they develop, we have that horizontal plane also. So when we're looking, as they start to advance with their speech patterns of coordinating those planes, and some kids do not do this, they'll stay at mama, but don't go into mommy. So if you say those words out loud, if you say ma me, you can see that your jaw is dropping in that vertical plane from ma, and then when you say me, you're going in that horizontal plane where you're protruding your lips or retracting them. And then ma me, you're going from a vertical plane to a retracted horizontal plane. So as they advance, we want to look at the development of these planes, where, where they're, what their babbling looks like, and if they are crossing these planes. And that happens between that 9 to 16 months and gets more advanced as they go from 16 to 24. So a good game to play and model is peekaboo because you're crossing those planes of movement for speech development. So, let's see if this works. Oh. Um, one person just commented and said that this is fascinating. Great. I'm glad you're enjoying it. So, when I go to parties, I find it very fascinating, too. Um, and I'm that one person. If I see a baby in a car seat, I'll have an entire conversation with them um, because I know every interaction is just pruning those pathways. So thank you for your feedback. Okay, good. I just wanted to check if that worked before I started it. But this will show you um, a good picture of those planes of movement. So we're going to see mom modeling the vertical plane. And then we're going to see mom model a different plane. And I want you to pay attention to um, what happens with the interaction. Can you say mama? Mama. Can you say dada? Dada. Yes! Can you say Sam? <laughs> Not yet. Can you say mama? Oh, she changed that plane of movement, didn't she? So he's got a nice foundation for that vertical plane for mama and dada, but for his own name, that Sam is going to be that retracted horizontal plane, and he's just not there yet. Um, he's getting there, though. Okay, so there is a study that revealed neural pruning and development in the areas for language rather than the motor cortex when comparing pre- and post-intense prompt therapy to kids with apraxia. So I want to go into a little bit about what apraxia is and childhood apraxia is a motor speech disorder and children with childhood apraxia of speech have problems saying sounds, syllables, and words. And this is not because of muscle weakness or paralysis. This is because the brain has problems planning to move the body parts like the lips, tongue, and jaw needed for speech. The child knows what he or she wants to say, but his or her brain has difficulty coordinating the muscle movements necessary to say those words. Um, I worked with a, a large population of kids with childhood apraxia, and a lot of times um, it shows up in different parts of their body. So I just want to check this video so I don't want to get your hopes up. Yep. Okay, so this is a little guy that I worked with who had childhood apraxia of speech, um, and I was doing prompt therapy with him. Prompt therapy um, stands for the proprioceptive range of movement and placement therapy. Um, it's a training that you can receive as a speech-language pathologist where you're providing tactile cues um, and following the development of speech to foster them for successful um, speech coordination. 
So we, this little guy, um, kind of like the guy that we saw before, was not crossing, not using his horizontal plane of movement. So he had the up and down, up and down, but he was not crossing. So we started working just at the vowel level, at that ooey, ooey, ooey. And this is a video of his parents show me the carryover that they do at home. They were a wonderful family. But I want you to also look at, he's two, um, so he should be combining two words together, um, but because of his apraxia, he was not doing that. What he was understanding of language was at a two-year-old level, um, so we started to see um, how this inability to coordinate and use those words started to affect him socially also. Um, so I want you to show, show you this little guy and pay close attention to his hands and how he's moving his hands because I want you to get a true look at what um, some apraxia looks like. Beep, beep. You say, ooh, baby. <laughs> so um, he was a cute little guy. He worked very hard and started to form some more words after I started to work with him. But we did um, set him up with an augmentative communication device to help foster that language and social development to keep it up with what he was missing um, from his speech development. Very important because we started to see it negatively affect his social development. But I wanted you to pay attention to his hands because he is two. Um, and if you looked at the de de dexterity of his hands, he was still doing kind of like a raking movement that you would see that's typical for a younger baby. Um, so that apraxia kind of flows out through their body. So watch out for those red flags. So some of the other red flags for speech is, again, not being able to coo or babble as an infant. Um, late with their first words, and they may be missing sounds from those words. Um, having a limited range of consonant and vowel productions. We saw with that little guy, he did start to babble some approximations with the back of his tongue and the front of his tongue. So he was getting there. They just weren't coordinated. Um, problems with combining those sounds and showing long pauses between sounds. Um, some kids simplify words by replacing difficult sounds with easier ones or deleting difficult sounds. Um, and some kids typically do this. Um, it's, it's a natural course of development but the child with apraxia speech does so more often. And some may even have problems eating, so there's a true oral motor capacity involved too. So how can speech development influence global development? And there's more than one right answer here. Um, I just want you to get thinking about where we're focusing today um, and how speech development um, should not be overlooked as they will just grow out of it because, it, again, they are developing simultaneously and they foster each other. So let me know what your thoughts are on how speech development can influence that global development, how the whole child is developing. So we can see that that speech development may have implications for social if they're not able to express themselves. It may come out in behaviors that are keeping them behind socially. Um, language development, if they're not uh, 
receiving those auditory signals in order to plan the motor plan motor plan motor planning for speech that's going to affect and halter their language of combining those words also their feeding development um, speech and feeding are very closely related so we're going to move on to feeding since we're jumping right from speech to feeding so I want to talk a little bit about how they're related and how Muscles used in feeding are the same muscles used for speech. And that's quoted from Sarah Johnson Rosenfeld, who works with Talk Tools. She does a lot of feeding therapy and speech therapy um, nationally. Her work is very recognized. So if we look at those muscles, we see there's a lot going on. And I want to show you how you can foster both feeding and speech development um, for them as they develop. So a lot of my kiddos who are picky eaters or have delayed speech, some of them go hand in hand. It's always my follow-up question. So let's look at the what when it comes to feeding our children. Um, biophysiologist Gary Buchamp um, had said that the early exposure of babies to flavor both in utero and through milk works as a kind of imprinting. And research shows that it takes very few exposures for a six-month-old to accept a new food, whereas it can take between 10 and 20 exposures for preschoolers. So the time is now. The first two years are thought to be a critical window of opportunity when it comes to nutrition, as children develop food preferences and learning to eat. More specifically, that four to seven month window is a critical window being, of being more receptive to acquiring new taste. Several studies have shown that when vegetables are introduced at this age, babies are more open-minded and it takes fewer exposures and has longer lasting effects. So when a seven month old um, babies in Germany were exposed to a vegetable puree, that they particularly disliked, such as spinach or green bean, it took only seven attempts for them to like it as much as their once preferred carrot puree. Two months later, all but 10% of the children still enjoyed the once hated vegetable, even though they now had reached an age of greater weariness. So from eight to 14 months, their sense of self starts to emerge, along with the recognition that I can refuse this, as a way of expressing oneself. So that flavor window is only fully open for a short time and it seems to be closing even at the age of four to six months. Gary Buchamp also talked about, um, had done research with moms where he gave them carrot juice the last trimester of pregnancy and then had them um, also eating it while they were nursing and they found that the children had strong preferences for carrot juice. So that's where he came up with that term imprinting power. So do you agree or disagree that babies need teeth to chew? Type in A if you agree and D if you disagree. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Babies don't need teeth to chew. Most can gum food if it's soft enough and dissolvable. Babies learn to chew long before they get most of their teeth. And not only is this in time important for food preferences, but also for developing the oral motor skills for speech and feeding. Babies naturally and instinctively put objects into their mouth to desensitize their gag reflex, which is prevalent at birth that food exploration is encouraged. Babies do not develop the ability to transfer food back until about eight months. So those big raw carrots, celery, or chewy tubes, if you'd rather not use a food, um, are important for promoting coordination of the tongue lateralization and chewing, both for speech and feeding. So we want them putting things in their mouth. So let's look at the how. 
We know that how parents and caregivers feed little ones is vital. From reading hunger and fullness cues to offering a variety of food the whole family eats and keeping meals pleasant. What you do in this two-year period sets the stage for future feeding and eating. There was a study done in Turkey um, where they found with the mother interviews and the, co and the college student interviews that kids, the feeding patterns that they had at two kind of stayed correlated strongly with the feeding patterns that they had when they were 20. So agree or disagree, kids are more secure around food when they are offered what they want and when they want it. Do you A, agree or disagree? This is a tricky one. <laughs> I'm just going to go, yeah. So one person said disagree and somebody else said I'm sure and then somebody else said I'm not. Good. Well, that's why you're here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is a tricky one. Um, so when we give kids what they want when they want it, um, this disrupts appetite regulation, that child's ability to be internally aware of when their tummy is full or feeling empty. And I actually learned this the hard way with my guys um, in terms of reflux. But having structured feeding times is very important. And for little ones, um, it's every two to three hours. And then for older one preschoolers, it's every three to four hours. And the proportion size should be um, of what they're eating totally should be equivalent to the size of their fist. So if you think about that, that's not very much. Um, when I worked in medical daycare centers in Atlantic City, we worked with a nutritionist. And we were giving two or three, or they were about two or three years old. For lunch, we'd give them um, like two chicken nuggets, more if they requested it, and tater tots and green beans. And she told us that we were overfeeding those children, that we should only give them one chicken nugget. Um, it was shocking. So if you have a little one who eats like a bird, um, it's probably okay, just as if you have that in your mind that their portion size total should be a fist, um, not to worry about it so much because they're already full. And when we tell them things like take one more bite, we're actually interrupting their appetite regulation. So we're going to go a little bit more into parenting feeding styles. Um, several longitudinal studies have found that children fed in such a way by uninvolved parents. These are the parents that provide, fail to provide food and fail to place any demands. Um, so the long studies have, have told us that they tend to weigh more as adults. If no one cares about much about feeding you, it's hard to learn healthy ways to feed yourself. When we look at the authoritarian style, um, these are the force feeders. They make the high demands, um, like you can't leave the table until you clear your plate. And they fail to recognize the child's ability um, and preferences. And that the authoritarian style has been linked to higher child weight also. Those children with authoritarian parents were five times more likely to be overweight. And that feeding style also prevents children from learning to recognize their own cues for hunger and fullness. By contrast, the indulgent um, caregivers and grandparents um, fall into this category a lot. They place few demands on what they're eating at mealtimes, and they allow children to eat whatever they want. I know whenever we go to my mother-in-law's house, she's always making muffins or has the flavored yogurt for the kids. They like to fatten them up. But the long-term study of those kids also um, are linked with adults that are overweight. The best um, feeding style is authoritative. So these parents are highly demanding that the child eats well, yet they're highly responsive to the cues from the child. So we'll go a little bit more into that. So how to capture the authoritative style. 
um, when we look at Ellen Satter, who was a child psychologist and nutritionist, um, she talks of the division of responsibility in feeding. From toddlerhood to adolescence, a parent should be responsible for what, when, and where. This would be environment, parenting style, and structure. And the child is responsible for the how much and whether or not they eat it. Um, and she said it, don't cater to your child, but do have their favorite foods sometimes. And this is true when we look at feeding therapy. We always have what we call a safe food present. So developmentally, um, we're looking at the stages of growth and development. And if we look at the child psychologist Jean Piaget, he defined four stages of cognitive development during childhood. The stage that your child is in as a toddler is called the pre-operational stage because the developing mind still isn't able to organize ideas and make logical conclusions. So that pre-operational stage not only lacks logic and is magical, but also is naturally egocentric and self-centered. As far as young children are concerned, the world revolves around them and other points of view don't exist, which limits their understanding. So if we place that um, in food, when we look at toddlers and preschoolers, um, we're seeing some challenges from a developmental perspective. And they're asserting a lot of their control um, through that. So a lot of times we'll tap into the magical realm of their development. Um, I remember my mom telling me, eat your carrots outside and all the bunnies will come. And it worked. So use that magic. Developmentally, um, as kids approach two, their push for independence, the rapid changes in cognition and slowed growth, along with appetite, explains the why most become more selective with food and choices. And as we can see, the parents on the left are dismayed to find that their previously broccoli pea-loving baby now rejects anything green. And children often show signs of what we call food neophobia, the reluctance to try anything new or familiar around this time. It's also um, largely hereditary. So if you um, had some food neophobia as a child, you're more likely to have a child that has food neophobia. Food jags are common whereby children request the same food for days, sometimes months in a row. There's not a parent who enjoys this stage, but as you know, it's all pretty normal. And how we handle and support these typical developmental stages sets the stage for fostering a positive relationship with food for a lifetime. But those are some red flags, um, and how we handle them is critical. So do you agree or disagree that toddlers only need to try new foods two to three times before knowing whether or not they like it. Type A if you agree or B if you disagree. Good. Researchers confirmed that toddlers and preschoolers need 10 to 20 exposures on different occasions to accept new foods. So if they don't like it the first time, try, try again. Uh, we also look at the environment is critical and includes not only exposure to these foods, but the influence of media and friends and family members' language. Um, we had this book. It was one of my boys' favorite, and that hippo did not say ooh in our version. That hippo said, mmm, broccoli stew, because I knew how important it was. And when parents describe their children as picky, it becomes part of their identity. So when they hear their parents say, oh, she won't eat that, the child believes that they, in fact, don't eat that. So environment is very critical. So some feeding red flags um, to keep an eye out for are when 
kids eat fewer and fewer foods over time until they are limited to about five to ten foods they will eat. Um, refusing foods of certain textures altogether, um, both sensory and may have some sensory and motor issues going on there. Um, when they will not accept new foods on their plate and will not tolerate even touching or tasting a new food and have physiological symptoms when they do so. So those physiological symptoms can include very subtle things like finger splaying or nostril flaring or an overall increase in respiratory rate. They may cry or scream in tantrum when new foods are placed on their plate. Um, also, some kids compensate with their finger. Um, this may be a sign of oral motor weakness where they need a little extra input to move the food rather than just using their mouth. So those are some feeding red flags to keep an eye out for. So we're going to move right along into language. When we look at language development, we're looking at phonology. So we can see now um, how the speech plays a role with them picking up sounds and imitating, imitating them. Vocabulary, those words, relationships, and concepts, how they're using them and understanding them. Morphology is those meaningful parts of words that may change the meaning. Uh, syntax are the rules for making sentences, so when to use her versus him and his versus hers, things like that, and pragmatics. So we covered that. You can kind of see how the speech and, and the social language is coming through here. Um, so that pragmatic language that we covered earlier is used based on that context and situation, what to do and how to do it. So when we look at language development, we're looking at how all those aspects of development play a big part in forming this. And reading, 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 exposing them to different vocabulary, sustaining their intention for um, books, all play a part in language development. So read, read, read. And we see um, some reading here. And we know that oral language skill and speaking and listening, so what they're saying and what they're understanding are predictors of later decoding and reading comprehension. So this is really important when we, they start um, kindergarten. When we look at language, we're also looking at reading and writing. So some language facilitation techniques from birth to three. Um, some simple things that you can do are modeling what they're seeing in their, envir their environment. So rather than asking them what it is, actually telling them what it is. Um, after that, we're, you can expand. So you're restating what the child has said and adding a little more. It's called the one-up rule. So if they're saying, mommy up, you can model, mommy up, please, in that sing-songy type of voice. And hopefully they'll expand that sentence length. And then elaboration, modeling additional language related to the child's utterance. And this is um, very socially involved, so reciprocating what they're saying by either asking a question or adding a comment and modeling those pragmatic functions with language. So we're going to go through each of them. So like I said, that modeling um, happens during those early stages at stage one. And um, we're just going to see something in the environment and label it. So if they're young and not talking yet, we'll probably best modeling babbling or um, single words. And as they grow older, you're still going to do the, the modeling. Um, if they see a new thing, you can model some of those pragmatic functions. Good morning, lambs. Expansions. Um, if the child says something, again, you're going to add on to it and also include what they said. So if they say dog, you can say, yes, it's a soft dog. Um, if they say, I'm building a garage, you're going to say, wow, you're building a big garage, giving them those added language pieces. And then elaborations. And again, this is where we're doing that back and forth reciprocal communication. Um, so if they're telling you what they're doing through planning, I push it. 
you can reciprocate by saying, are you going to the store and have them elaborate on their play scenarios. One thing I wanted to talk about was rate of speech. Um, it has shown that when we are faster or if we have kids that have some auditory processing difficulty, when we slow down our speech, um, kids not only stay more calm and alert, but they're also fully integrating that auditory information and able to process it. When we're hurried and rushed, that gets um, them not only a little bit stressed out, but they're not more not in a position where they're going to optimally learn new vocabulary. And Mr. Rogers was a good model of preschool rate of speech. Um, and right now I think it's Daniel Tiger that's available on PBS, but they also kind of model what Mr. Rogers did. Um, the screen time is longer and the language is slower and more repetitive. I also wanted to discuss some wait time. So when um, children are expected to be at that developmental stage of responding um, or adding their ideas, if you're asking them a question, give them that wait time. So a lot of times if they don't answer right away, we move on or give them the answer. Um, and a lot of kids, you know, particularly ones that fall along the spectrum or with language delay, um, you can get a nice, some nice objective data by asking them a question, um, giving them the answer and seeing how long it takes for them to respond. Um, some kids will take, you know, five to five seconds and some kids will take ten. Um, but each time we give them that pause to respond, they're pruning that pathway and it gets shorter and shorter each time. Typically it's three seconds. So, which is not much time um, to wait for a response, but socially that's what we expect. Um, so waiting a little bit longer to see if they can prune those pathways. So let's watch another video. Hmm. Well, I'm sorry about that. I don't know why. We did check. But this is a model of uh, baby Sam that you saw earlier who was crossing planes of movement. And mom is, um, she's basically modeling language for him, modeling the motorcycle, modeling cup, modeling what he's eating. So some preschool speech and language red flags. Um, to look for are misuse of pronouns. Um, typically this do, will happen and will resolve itself pretty quickly with some modeling. Um, it's those kids who don't respond to the modeling and um, keep using wrong pronouns or missing a pronoun. Misuse of WH questions. Labored speech patterns could be uh, significant for apraxia. Those final, final consonant omissions are a red flag. We want to look at that auditory memory and why they're missing those final sounds. Word order confusions and word recall. If their speech is hard to understand more than 50% of the time, or if it sounds choppy, monotonous, or stresses the wrong syllable or word. Um, failure to respond, and difficulty with understanding and using spatial concepts. So if you see any of those, we want to look further into those and why they're happening. So typical pronoun development between a year and two years, they should be using the I, it pretty um, prominently without confusing it. And then as they get older, um, they can include the my, me, mine, you. A lot of kids will um, confuse the you and I, um, and that would be a red flag. So as they get older, between 31 and 34, they start to use the your, she, he, yours, and we. And then 
as they progress, it includes they, us, hers, his, them, her. So if you look at the questions that you're asking, um, you can alter them to elicit the appropriate pronoun. So um, for example, if you say who's brushing their teeth, she is or he is, you would expect you're waiting for a 31 to 34 month old to respond with that. Um, where we wouldn't say whose toothbrush is it because then we're expecting them to know his or hers, which doesn't occur to 35 to 40. So pronoun development is good to have in your back pocket when you're asking those questions. Some other ways that you can help with communication. Um, it's good to start off with asking an open-ended question. This enables you to determine where their skill is. Um, and if you're not getting a response, you can provide verbal models in response to the question um, or mix in yes-no options. So for example, if I ask where should we go and the child doesn't respond, um, because they're feeling overwhelmed, you can mix in a yes-no um, or choice questions. Should we go to the bathroom or to the playground? And if they still don't answer, then you mix in those yes-no. Do you need to go to the bathroom? Um, and give them a visual too, if that helps. So providing those visuals and labels to expose them not only to print, um, which is important for later reading and writing, um, but it also helps take the pressure off of verbalizing. So let's practice. You ask a child if he needs to use the bathroom and he does not respond. What should you do? A, mix in yes, no. B, provide verbal responses. Or C, repeat the question repeatedly until the child answers. And there could be more than one right answer to this one. Yeah, so we could either do A or B. Um, it's a trial and error type of thing, but you want to scaffold them to the next level and know where they are and make communication as easy as you can for them. So that brings us to... That brings us to where we're wrapping it up for today's webinar. I hope you learn some new things um, and I hope it became really clear how some of these skills are happening simultaneously and depend upon one another and how rapidly that they're how rapidly they're developing together. Okay, so some questions that we have that have popped up are um, if a child is developmentally way ahead of peers in speech development, can that be a red flag? This is a good question. Um, you want to think no way, right? But we're not only looking at speech development. So there can be a child who's way ahead in speech development but socially is not using that speech um, and le specifically language um, in a use that would be expected for their age. So um, it's not always, it's not a red flag per se, but um, again we don't want to just isolate looking at one component um, like speech. We want to look at the whole child. Because I've had some kids who language-wise and speech-wise were very articulate had beautiful language skills, but they just did not know how to use them socially. So um, we want to keep that in mind. 
And the other question we had are, are there certain health diagnoses such as Down syndrome where children should be evaluated early and proactively before waiting for red flags? This is a great question, and yes, um, they should be recommended from birth and followed by specialists so that they can, um, specifically I'm glad that they asked about Down syndrome because there are oral motor things that we can actually do from birth when their palate is very malleable to help them with that low tone that's inherent to their diagnosis. Um, so I'll just use that as an example um, where we can do some palatal massages to widen that palate because of their down, their, that diagnosis part of it is that hypotonia, their low tone in their mouth, um, their tongue is staying in a position where, um, and you often see it with kids with Down syndrome, where it's kind of sitting open and out of their mouth. Um, there are oral motor exercises and oral motor placement therapeutic techniques that we can do um, to help widen that palate from early on so that they can easily retract that tongue. It's not that their tongue is bigger. Um, it has to do with tone and the anatomy of their palate and their oral musculature. So I'm glad this question was asked and those kids with any diagnosis should be referred immediately from birth. Thank you for asking that question. Um, so that concludes what we have for today. I hope you enjoyed yourself and it was helpful. Thank you for joining us um, for today's webinar. Uh, please visit VFN's website at vermontfamilynetwork.org for helpful resources and upcoming webinars and other workshops and events. This webinar will be archived along with all of VFN's other webinars and can be viewed on Vermont Family Network's YouTube channel. If you would like to talk with someone at VFN, please call 1-800-800-800. 4005. Have a great day.